Undercover Jet Setter. Travel. Going all out to know your family history? Hear from the author who uncovered the story of his father and uncle during World War II fighting the Nazis and the Soviets. And the story comes full circle in his European homeland in just a few days from now. It's a fascinating and inspiring story that could help your family history research. Cheers, everyone. John Daly here with Undercover Jet Setter. The book is called Captured in Liberation. It chronicles the story of a family caught between the Nazis and the Soviets in World War II when Hitler and Stalin secretly planned to exterminate and split Poland. The author is Andrew Bida. He is a business professor at Cuyahoga Community College outside of Cleveland, Ohio. He joins us now. Andy, welcome to the show. Thank you, John. It's a pleasure to be here. Great to have you. Well, uh, I want to get into the book. I want to get into your personal journey of writing the book, along with your dad's and uncle's historic odyssey. But I don't want to bury the lead. You're preparing for a trip with your dad now in his 90s to Poland for a moving ceremony and a meeting with government officials there in Poland. Tell us about that. Right. So um, this coming Friday, um, we'll be leaving to Warsaw and we'll be spending about four days, uh, actually about five days in Warsaw. On uh, May 12th is the uh, is a very big celebration in Poland. There was a famous general named General Anders, and uh, he was a, a general who, who led some very historic uh, battles in World War II. Uh, he died on May 12th, um, so there's a uh, there will be a ceremony honoring General Anders on May 12th. Uh, the night before the ceremony, I'm actually going to be meeting with his daughter, who is the Secretary of State of Poland. Uh, we befriended her in Cleveland. We're going to have a dinner with her, and we expect that to be a, a very uh, moving uh, moving event. Um, the day after the 12th, I just now got a text from a Poland uh, radio station. They spoke to me yesterday, and they're getting back to me. They want to do a, a television interview uh, with my father at our hotel on Monday. So there's a lot of events that will be taking place in Warsaw. Uh, then a couple of days later, we're going to fly on a, on a government uh, military plane to Rome, and we will be ta- uh, participating in a ceremony that honors the General Anders' historic victory at Monte Cassino. So it'll be May 18th will be the 75-year anniversary of the historic Battle of Monte Cassino. Uh, there's a lot of soldiers uh, buried there in the military cemetery from really all around the world. So May 18th will be a ceremony, again, honoring General Anders. Um, The uh, contingent will be flying back to Warsaw, but my father and I are going to stay in Italy. Uh, I'm going to take him to some places where he was during the war, hasn't been since the war. So we're going to take a tour. We're going to go to Ancona. We'll be going to Bologna uh, to see some historic sites, as well as uh, places where he was stationed at. And then we're going to end the trip. Uh, we're going to go back to his hometown in a small village called Boknia, which is not too far from Krakow. So we're going to go back there for about the last four or five days. And my I, my first cousins live in the actual property where my father grew up. So wow. we're actually going to be having a, a big uh, celebration there on a Saturday night. They'll be inviting family from all over that region of Poland. Now, I don't know if I told you this, John, but I'm going to have a special guest because there's a, a lady friend of mine who uh, I haven't seen in years. Uh, she's going to come and join us all the way from China. So she's going to be with us for those four or five days. She was also grew very close to my father. So this is going to be quite a trip. Uh, you know, it's going to be about 16, 17 days, fully action packed. And I'm really looking forward to it. Well, now, will you be will you be posting photos and videos along the way? I absolutely will. I, um, from when I be, first began this whole project, uh, I, I started a travel blog, and it's uh, my name, first initial, last name, which is abaida.com. That's A-B-A-J-D-A.com. And throughout the trip, I'm going to be taking uh, lots of video, lots of photos, and on my website, um, I do have a travel blog. So I'm probably just about every day going to be posting some updates to that blog. 
Well, I'll I'll definitely be watching it, and then also I'm gonna get you I'm gonna get you our book on. It's called the TV Studio in Your Hand, so it'll give you some extra tips on uh, shooting video off a smartphone. Yeah. Uh, so we'll, I'll definitely get you that. Really looking forward to seeing that. Um, you, you were you were mentioning how you've had a relationship before with um, the Secretary of State of, of Poland. Um, real briefly, talk talk about an exhibit that you brought from Poland back to Ohio for people to see, because uh, you you live in an area. It's really a large population of uh, Polish Americans. Uh, talk, oh, yeah. talk about that exhibit. Yeah, there's a lot of uh, Polish Americans here. You're absolutely right about that. Um, so I had the book, you know, got out about two years ago. And somehow the book got in the hands of the ambassador, the Poland ambassador to the United States. His name is Piotr Vilcek. So he sent me an invitation to uh, come to uh, Washington, D.C. to participate in a service. And I brought my father with me, and he, and he asked for a private meeting. He wanted to meet my father, you know, who the book is about. So we had this private meeting. I thought it would last about five minutes, and we were in, in there for a good hour. Uh, he was just taken back by the story. He was so fascinated. And when I told him that I give a lot of book talks and that, I, you know, I see the pride in a lot of Poles who are finally hearing the stories, he, he made a phone call. He said, I'd like you to do something for me. And he called the Poland Secretary of State. Anna Maria Anders, who is also the daughter of the General Anders, he got us on the phone together and he said that he'd like to bring a traveling exhibit to Cleveland. And, um, it, you know, it tells the story of the Anders Army, which is really what this, you know, th th this whole trip is going to be about. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but he also asked that Anna Maria come and join us in Cleveland, because Anna Maria is an avid spokesperson for her father, uh, for the Polish military. Uh, she came to Cleveland for a weekend. It was a long weekend, and I thought it would be very formal, very official, but we, we, we actually have become like family. We had some parties. I took her to a Browns game on a Thursday night. It was the first <laughs> time the Browns had won in two years, so she says uh -huh. she was the reason. Uh, I gave a talk a couple of days later. I presented her with a Browns jersey. I have it on video, and she was just, you know, it was very emotional. It was really fun, uh, fun, fun whole weekend of events. So ever since, um, you know, that trip, we, we've actually stayed in contact. Uh, we we become quite close. Uh, she's very excited because just recently she's been appointed to be Poland's ambassador to Italy. So that, that, that's, a, that's a real honor for her, and it's a natural fit for her. So as I mentioned, we're actually going to have dinner with her the Saturday before the uh, you know, reception honoring her father. And, and I'll tell you something else, John. My, my father uh, has a gift he's going to give her. When he was in a prison camp in Romania during the war, he managed to get a compass from one of the Romanian soldiers, which he used to guide his escape. Wow. He's going to, this is a beautiful compass. It's in a leather K, beautiful compass. And he's going to present it to her when we have dinner on the Saturday night. Wow. And he, 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 he couldn't, he wanted to give her something. He couldn't figure what to give her. And he, and he came up with this idea. He's going to give it to her and he's going to say, this is the compass that guided me to join your father's army. And now I give it to you to guide you in your journey. So, I'm definitely going to take some photos of that moment. Wow. Wow. That's fabulous. Just real briefly on the um, exhibit that came to Cleveland. Is that exhibit still there or has that been um, just, it just is, had a short? It is still in Cleveland. I actually used it a number of places. Uh, we had talks at local universities, uh, libraries. It is going to be going to Chicago. So we pr I probably won't have it much longer, but it is going to be traveling to Chicago. But it's an exhibit that has about uh, 16 panels that all show the story of the Anders Army. It's, it's titled The Trail of Hope. And it's based upon a book that Norman Davies had written about the Anders Army called mm -hmm. The Trail of Hope. So the exhibit just kind of uh, it tells the story of that, uh, of that Trail of Hope. Okay, so um, just for, for anybody who's listening, um, in Cleveland, where is it now? Or can they go see it now? Well, right now it's in my bedroom. <laughs> <laughs> okay, where's your bedroom? No, we can. <laughs> now, so, so if people would like to uh, to reach you or find out more about this, the best way is to go to your site, the yeah, abita. You know, com. And, and you you bring up a great point. Um, we do and until Chicago officially, you know, asks for it because I, you know, I've been told, you know, they're they're getting it next. 
But until that's official, and when I come back from my trip to Poland, we I still do have it. So if anybody, and, and it's a beautiful display. Um, everywhere we've had it, it's been very moving. We we normally keep it up, you know, at various you know venues for about a week, and it, it's it's drawn some nice crowds. And you know, there's a you know in this area, Buffalo, uh, you know, it's, it's not far away. There's a lot of poles there. But mm -hmm. yeah, if anybody is interested in having the exhibit, um, you know, I can't say exactly how long, but they can certainly contact me. And as long as it's in my hands, I'd be happy to uh, make it available. All right, cool. Uh, we are talking with Andy Baida. He is the author of the book Captured in Liberation. Uh, you can get the book at his website, and he just gave you the site. Let me give it to you again: www abida.com and that's a b a j d a dot com uh, bida is a polish name so the j kind of sounds like a y um, so again the website is www.abajda just think of jda john daly afterwards aba and yeah. you can you can you can easily come up with it that way um, if if you can just give me a quick synopsis of the story in your book and, and how your dad and your uncle connect to the famous Anders army Right. So uh, September 3rd of 1939, uh, in a small town of, uh, of Poland, which is Bochnia, Germany had already invaded Poland on September 1st, and that was the beginning of World War II. So my father um, and his family, a group of 12, all got on a horse-drawn carriage to escape the invasion, which they knew would be coming any day. Uh, and it actually came the night that they left. Um, they, they went on a journey east uh, thinking they would escape the German invasion and be safe. But after 12 days of travel, uh, they found out that the Russians invaded from the east. Um, as you had mentioned, Stalin and Hitler had a secret pact to invade uh, and conquer Poland. So um, the family found themselves in, the, in a quagmire. They were in the middle. Uh, they were all of a sudden refugees away from their home. And they were in the middle of both the Russian and German occupation, uh, saw a lot of, you know, things, a lot of people being shot and killed and taken prisoner. They actually were hostages in a small uh, monastery, you know, crowded with, uh, you know, hundreds of people. And that, that's where the story begins. And from that point on, uh, my father, uh, they, they did end up going, making their way back to Poland. They actually felt being in their hometown under German occupation was the lesser of two evils between being that or being a refugee in the Russian occupation, which just goes to show you how dire you know, their situation was. Um, I had an uncle, Stefan, who, you know, he, he didn't want to just, you know, lay around while all this was happening. So he left on, on a quest to join the army to fight, you know, both sides. He was captured by the Russians, tortured, uh, sent to Siberia, which you know he thought was going to be his death sentence. Uh, my father was sent away. You know the Germans sent him various places to work for them, but he escaped from that, and he got word of Anders' army. It was an army that had formed an army made up of the um, prisoners in Siberia who were, who were eventually released. Because after uh, Germany, um, after Germany uh, went into Russia to invade Russia, uh, Stalin actually released all the prisoners, hoping they would fight for his Red Army. Mm -hmm. And that was where the Anders Army was formed. So it was an army of Polish uh, soldiers who, who were released from prison. A ragtag army started with 20,000 you know, uh, soldiers. It grew to about 60,000 soldiers. Um, they eventually escaped, you know, from uh, Russia to fight with the English. So my uncle was on that, you know, part of the journey, you know, joining the Anders Army. Uh, meanwhile, my father, who was forced to work for the Germans, he was getting word of the Anders Army, and he was on a quest to join the Anders Army. So he basically traveled all across of Europe. Um, you know, he escaped uh, from a work camp in uh, Austria. He was captured in Romania. He escaped from that. And he eventually did join the Anders Army in Italy. Uh, he eventually did reunite with his brother, Stefan. So they both came different, you know, sir, uh, sir, sir, I'm not sure if I can say that word right, uh, different routes to get there. 
but it's just a fascinating journey. You know, it's a fascinating journey of, of how they survived, how they met, how they participated and fought for the Anders Army. And as you can imagine, there's a lot of adventures uh, all along the way. So it, it was a really fun story for me to write. And it's really fun for me now to share the story with other people and have people learn and understand the bravery of those Polish soldiers and just how pivotal how pivotal they were in the Allied um, uh, uh, battles, you know, that, that, that took place during World War II. And, and and also, you know, the formation of the of the 20th century after that as well. Um, I, I love the forward of your book. You talk about watching TV as a kid uh, with your dad in the 1960s and shows like Hogan's Heroes comes on. And yeah. if, if you don't know about the comedy about the German Stalag where allied forces have been captured by inept Germans like Colonel Klink, Hogan <laughs> or Sergeant Schultz, I know nothing. Folks, yep. look it up. It's a very funny show. It's a staple <laughs> of the 60s. But Andy, tell us tell us about your dad's reaction to seeing that parody of the Nazis from the right. 1960s and what he went through less than 20 years before. And talk about that and what led to your dad allowing you to actually explore his story. Yeah, I'll tell you, John, that was the first indication I got that my father had lived so, a somewhat exciting life. We would watch those, uh, you know, those movies and TV shows, like you said, Hogan's Heroes, and we'd watch some of the movies of you know, Great Escape uh, that were really popular at that time. And we'd watch Hogan's Heroes, and my father would, you know, it was one of the few things I remember doing together, you know, and really enjoying it. He would laugh, and he said, that's exactly, you know, it looks exactly like the prison camp that I was in. And wow. that Sergeant uh, Schultz, he reminds me of the sergeant we had, and uh, and so I got an indication that, wow, my, my dad was a prisoner in a war camp. Yeah. And I got to learn bits and pieces. I learned how he escaped, and it was a pretty daring escape, but I didn't really learn a whole lot more. And I'll tell you, John, I, I thought, you know, I was kicking myself five, six years ago thinking I had this great story at the tip of my tongue, but I'm never going to learn it, you know, because yeah. we all go on with our busy lives. And uh, one day my daughter, uh, she had been gone for a year in Alaska as a vol doing some volunteer service. She, she, I took her to visit her grandparents. And uh, my mother said something that prompted Lauren to say, Grandma, have you ever been accused of being a spy? And my father sat very calmly and said, well, well I was. And right now, you know, he was sent to this prison accused of being a spy we spent the next two hours getting out of Natalus, where it happened, uh, all the events surrounding it. So I spent the next, you know, year plus just every weekend going there to visit to learn more of the story. And the more we talked, the more he remembered. Uh, it became, you know, it, it just became something that was a part of our life. And I had so much fun doing it. I had so much fun talking to him. And I was recording everything and I was writing things down and it got to the point that I said to myself, you know, this would make quite a book. Um, so I started, you know, chronicling it and I had probably had about 100, 150 pages and I was about ready to publish. But somebody told me, they said, you know, you really need to go there. You really need to retrace your father's steps. You, you need to visit the places he was, see it. Wow. And that's when I planned, that was in the summer of 15, I planned a six-week trip uh, to Europe, and that made all the difference in the world. When I came back from there, my eyes were opened, uh, and then, of course, it, you know, it brought more things for us to talk about. It created more awareness of him, um, and it, it just hasn't stopped from there. I mean, we, we just, you know, oh. have continued this journey. I finally did get the book published, but I'll tell you, John, since the book has, pub has been published, so many things have happened and so many new things I've learned that I'm actually working with my publisher to do an update. And uh, we're going to, you know, after I get back, I'm going to finish my writing and probably add about 50 pages to the book with some pretty incredible stories. Um and so, you know, and, and I don't know where it's going to end. I mean, it's just it's just been a fascinating journey. 
Wow, so, that's that's uh, fabulous. I want to I want to get into a, a little later on, you know, how other people can do it and tips that you might have. But what what is the book done for 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 your dad? I mean, he's he's ninety five now. What, what what has it done for him? Man, uh, it, it's like I don't know where to begin. It's it's changed his life. I I actually uh, I did a video. I had a, a group here at the college that did a video for me, and it was, it was a beautiful job they did. And basically, it was to capture the story of, you know, the Secretary of State coming here and, you know, and, and just to see my father, how happy he is. And I mentioned in the video that I truly believe that my father's 94th year, at the time he was 94, may be his happiest. He is, you go to his house. We Unfortunately, we lost my mother about a year ago. Yeah. And my father was her caretaker. You know, he, he was there for her. He made sure that, you know, she, she um, would always stay in, in the house. Uh, but, um, you know, he, he's though now his life has kind of taken on a whole new aspect, a whole new journey. Um, his room is, you know, his house is just filled with books. Um, he was, uh, there was a big celebration in Cleveland last weekend, a Polish celebration for Constitution Day. Uh, they asked him to be the, um, uh, the Grand Marshal of a parade. Oh, wow. So he, so here I am sitting with him in the back of a car going through the Cleveland neighborhood in, in a parade, and the smile just won't leave his face. He he is um you know he is just living a life that you know after his story be hidden all these years he's a very humble quiet man. I even asked him I said did you tell your friends you're in the parade? He said no I didn't want to you know I don't want to sound like I'm bragging. <laughs> <laughs> but but you can just see his joy, his happiness. You know, I have pictures with him, the Cleveland mayor, together, and it, it it it's hard to explain just how. And if you look at the website, you know, the videos, the pictures of him, you you would just see the happiness on him. So wow. it, it's really cool for me to see this quiet, humble, religious man who kept this you know story to himself, you know, and raised a family, you know, with through hard work and all that. That all of a sudden he's he can enjoy the fruits of his labor, and you know he's almost like you know we all laugh he's becoming the rock star. So <laughs> it, it's really been a lot of fun for me to see that, and, and, and you know I'll be with him on this you know trip to Europe. You know people say how can your dad travel? He's 95. You know we're going to be 17 days in Europe. Um, he's he's probably going to be the one that's I'm probably going to be the one dragging. You know he's just got so much energy. He's so excited about this trip that uh, I'm really looking forward to going on it with him. Uh, that's so good. I'll be, I'll be anxious to see uh, the, the uh, video and, and the photos as well. Uh, we are talking with Andy Bida. He is the author of the book Captured in Liberation. It's available at his website, www.abajda.com. He and his dad, Ian, who, who is still alive, we've just been talking about. They're heading to Poland next week for a ceremony remembering Anders' army and their fight against the Nazis. Andy, my my wife Terry is a high school buddy of yours, and and she 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 was the first one to turn me on to your book. And you and I were going to talk a while back, but we lost my father in law, Terry's dad. And it's funny we have we have a number of stories from him during the depression in the mill towns of Pennsylvania, and you know, kind of family stories that kind of explain that. But you know, I I wish we had done more. You know, I shoot a TV show on an iPhone, and I, I feel like you know I didn't chronicle enough. Right. What's your advice to people if they've got either a grandfather or a grandmother or an older father or an older mother? What's your advice to them? Is just 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 do it, just chronicle it, write it down. Do you have any ways? Right. Yeah. Um, I, I certainly do have uh, something to say. But first of all, I, I'd like to say I knew Terry's dad. Right. Uh, what a great guy he was. Uh, I, I was really saddened to hear, you know, of, of the loss. And, and he, he he was quite a man. I remember him from high school. But I think the the important thing is, you know, so many people now with social media, you know, it's all about, you know, the instant gratification. We, we, we don't talk as much. We, we, we don't listen. We just, you know, want to look at what's the, you know, the latest video or mem or, you know, it, it's all that instant gratification. But it's so important to talk and listen. And while we still have our parents or grandparents or, you know, family members, take the time to sit and listen and talk, ask questions, get out an atlas, you know, to try to see and understand where they were. Just take that time. Um, you know, we, we need to put down our phones. 
turn off the TV, uh, you know, maybe get a bottle of wine and just talk. I really think that, you know, I, I see that more in, in, Euro, in the European culture than here. Uh, but, but I think it's so important that we do that because, like I said, John, I came probably a blink of an eye from not knowing my father's story. Had my daughter not asked the question, you know, if, if, my, if my mother <laughs> had ever been a spy, I can't tell you how my life has changed once I started listening and learning and chronicling. It's changed everything for me. And, you know, it, it could have so easy. And, and then, then I think of the times we almost lost my father, you know, to a heart attack. You know, we thought he was gone. Wow. You know, how had that happened, you know, um, I wouldn't have the richness. So, you know, while we and, and, and you know, don't make excuses, don't don't say, well, I should have done it. You know, start now. Mm -hmm. Take the time to talk to your family members. Uh, take, uh, you know, and with social media, with, you know, the, with the technology we have, take videos. Uh, you know, take photos, you know, document it, share it, because th that's treasure. You know, that, 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 that history, that family history is a treasure. And you never know what you're going to uncover. And, and I really believe that the more you learn, you know, from our, about our family, about our history, the more you learn about yourself. Um, it, 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 it's just, you know, like I said, for me, it's just changed my life. And I have no idea where it's going, but it's just added so much richness uh, to my life that, I, you know, I, I can't imagine now where I would be if I didn't have all this behind me. It's it's interesting. I'm uh, I'm in the midst of reading a book uh, by Ben Shapiro. He's the conservative, young conservative writer. And I know a lot of people who are on the liberal side wouldn't want to read him. But he wrote this book called The Right Side of History. And he makes the case of how too many kids in our younger generation today don't understand Western civilization. He goes back to, you know, not only Jerusalem, but also Athens and how that built up. And, yeah. I, and I do think he's right about a lot of that. And uh, to me, if you do something like this, because your parents and your grandparents are that link to really the Western civilization that really has created the world as to where we are today. And to me, you know, maybe we're not getting Western civilization courses in, in college like like we used to before, like I did and probably you did. Right. Um, and this is this is a great way to do this. And now you're 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 a business professor at Cuyahoga Community College. By the by the way, Cuyahoga Community College, one of the great schools, I think, that that, that I've seen. Um, being a professor, did that help you do the research or not being a professor? Could it hinder somebody? Um, no, I don't think so. Uh, you know, I, I think it all comes down to just having the will, H having the will to, you know, to learn, to, to take the time to, you know, to talk and listen, um, you know, and, and the best kind of research is primary research. You know, when you find information out yourself from, you know, talking to people, uh, secondary research is valuable and there's so much of it available, especially today in the information age, we can all go back and get information about our ancestry. I know that's become very popular and it's, and it's awesome to take advantage of those sites. That's a good way to get started. But there's nothing like primary research of just taking the time to talk to people. And, you know, you talk to one person, you learn a story, and that leads to something else, which, you know, takes you to somewhere else. It's, you know, it's like you become a, you know, an investigator of sorts. It's fascinating, like the journey that it will take you on. So, um, you know, I, I wouldn't say that being a college professor has enabled me to do that any better than anybody else. I think it's really a desire a desire just to take the time to, uh, you know, to, to do the research. Um, and, and, and the other thing I would say is you shouldn't, it shouldn't be looked at as a chore, as a task. Mm -hmm. It should be looked at as something fun. Uh, it's an adventure. It's, it's excitement. Um, you know, like I said, put down the phone, you know, instead of watching somebody else's adventure, create your own adventure. Um, because there's so much, you know, in, in our history, so much in, from our families that we can learn. And that and that just leads to, to even more learning, you know, about what was happening during that time, uh, who was in charge, why things were the way they were. Really important that we take the time to do that. So if, if you were to give us like two or three tips, the first one is just sit down and record your parent or grandparent. Um, second one is would be to, um, you know, go online and do some research about 
the time or the instances that we're talking about. Do you have a third one that, that maybe uh, folks could kind of uh, hang their hats on? I would say travel. Go to the places. Uh, you know, we'll hear the story about the places and then go there and visit it. Mm-hmm. Like I said, I was ready to publish my book. You know, I was ready to publish it. And then someone said, you know, you should visit the countries, retrace the steps. Yeah. That was amazing. And that's led to so many more things. And, and in doing that, I met people. I met people who, who have become lifelong friends. I'm going to go back on my trip, you know, next week and see people that I met in the summer of 15 who have been done so much for me. And, um, you know, they'll introduce you to other people. Um, and, and before you know it, you know, you've got a web. Your, your network is just expanding. You just keep learning more and more, more doors open. Um, so, you know, while it's good to sit at your computer and gather information, you know, and, and that's certainly, you know, a, a, a smart thing to do, I would say get out, you know, go and travel and visit the places where this has happened because that opens up a whole more, a different avenue. It's interesting because um, uh, one of my first books, uh, I, I talk about navigating a media biased world, and I have a system called the Royal System, and it's read, observe. In other words, go there, like you're yep. saying, and interview, and then the L stands for learn and putting it all together. And one of yep. the other things that I, I tell people is, is you know, if you want to get rid of bias or your media bias, you really want to understand what's going on, start traveling. Start seeing the rest of the world, how other people are, you know, how other people live and you're, you, you'll get a different perspective from them. So, it, it, you know, you're hitting everything that, that, that I definitely talk about. Talk about the research in Poland, because for someone like me, I know I'm, I'm of Irish descent. I can go there and, you know, most of the stuff's probably in English that right. I could do some research. Was it difficult for you going to Poland? You know, I mean, that, that does add a little bit of different challenge. And I actually traveled by myself through, you know, six different countries with six different languages. But, you know, that's to me, that's part of the fun. Because, you know, when, when you do travel, you find ways to communicate with people, uh, which does open doors. And typically in Europe, you know, the younger generation particularly, you know, they, they speak English, so at least passable English. So you can typically <laughs> find somebody, you know, who can help you. But... um But, you know, there are still ways you can communicate. I'll give you an example. I I went to uh, Austria in the small town where my father was sent by the Germans to work during the war. I went back in the summer of 15. Uh, I wanted to, you know, go to the house where my father was actually at a butcher's farm, where he was actually working. I knock on the door, and this, you know, uh, the housekeeper was there, and I said I was wondering if Mrs. Sch- if the Schusters still live here. She looked at me strange and v- eventually invited me in, and took me to a room where there was an old woman laying in bed, and she looked at me like I was, you know, an alien, and I was talking. She didn't understand a word I was saying, but eventually I said Marion or Ian. My father's name Ian, long as Marion. Mm-hmm. I said Ian in Poland. Her face, the expression on her face just changed. Tears came out. She was a little girl when my father escaped the farm. Last time she saw him, you know, they woke up one morning and he was gone. And here, you know, 60, 70, some years later, his son comes to the house. She spoke nonstop for an hour in German. Unfortunately, I didn't understand what she was saying, but we communicated enough and she brought out photos. And, you know, I was able to take, you know, pictures of a lot of those photos and learn and at least get a feel for, you know, what the house was like. So, you know, um, it, it, it would have been it was nice, you know, for my father to tell me about it. But when I went there, even though and even though we couldn't speak the language, what I experienced in that visit is something that I'll never forget. So, um, you know, it, it, it's I wouldn't let the language barrier slow you down, you know, from doing research. Mm-hmm. Um, it, in fact, it actually creates more excitement and adventure. And man, what you said something that was so true, the best way to remove bias is to actually travel. You know, we get news here that tells us, you know, one thing based upon somebody's viewpoint. But when you go to a country, you see the people, live with them, see how they live, you know, you, you will have a whole different perspective. And, and, and that, that was really good advice that you had mentioned there. 
All right. We are talking with Andy Bida, the author of the book Captured in Liberation. He chronicles Anders' army, their the famous fight against the Nazis, also sometimes the Soviets during World War II. Uh, both his father and uncle were a part of it. The book is available at his website. It's www.abida.com. So that's A-B-A-J-D-A dot com. And, you know, your book is 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 so important and, and not just for your family, because this tells the story of totalitarianism in the 20th century. It, 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 like you were saying, we're inundated with so many reams of information thanks to social media. And a lot of it fails to kind of realize the heroes of the time. Um, mm. d- does it hit you on how you're actually helping people understand the good life that, you know, let's face it, you, you and I had pretty decent lives in, you know, 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s. Right. Thanks to your, thanks to your dad and people like him. Right. I'll tell you the one thing that does hit me, John. When I give talks, a lot of the people that come are uh, Polish immigrants. Mm-hmm. Uh, they lived, you know, they're like maybe, you know, in their 40s up or, you know, a, a variety of ages. And anybody in Poland was living during the Soviet occupation where, where all these stories of Anders, Anders was not considered a hero in Poland in the 70s. He was considered a traitor because under the Soviet teaching, you know, right. he, he, he was like, you know, anti-Soviet. He, he, he could never go back to Poland. He's actually buried at Monte Cassino. So I tell these stories and people, I've, I've actually had people of Polish descent come up to me with tears, say, thank you. It is so nice and refreshing that we can now be proud. We can learn and understand the story, you know, of our heroes, uh, which were hidden from us for so long. So, you know, it, it's it's really rewarding for me to see, you know, how how so many people from Polish descent can feel proud. And it's also important for young people here to know and understand, you know, the true true history. Um, and, and, and these things that we learn now should also be signs of what we should not allow mm-hmm. to happen in the future, because there are certainly lessons to be learned. Um, you, know, you mentioned about the totalitarianism. It's dangerous. You know, too much nationalism, it, it is dangerous. Uh, we're, we're better when we're all working together, you know, towards peace than we are, you know, in, in uh, th- this nationalism that, you know, w- w- where countries are, um, you know, kind of attacking one another. But there are so many lessons that are to be learned. So you, you're right. I mean, I, I I've learned a lot from this, uh, from you know, from this journey that I've taken. And you are right too. We we should be very thankful and appreciative for what the people of our parents' generation did because they were the greatest generation. The hardships that they suffered, we can't even imagine today. And it's important that you know we acknowledge that and understand that. But also learn from that so that we don't allow those same mistakes to happen again. No, I agree. My dad also fought in Italy, so uh, and he's he's been long gone. But I got as many stories as I could. His, his stories were more. He ended up being a chef for the generals, <laughs> and he he knew opera, so he actually directed <laughs> opera when he was in Italy. He says that was the greatest time of my life. So I wish he was still alive. He could tell more of those stories. Right. Um, you, you mentioned on this, it, you know, things kind of come a little full circle. You know, Germany is now a part of the EU, no longer a military threat. The Soviet Union is really no longer communist. It's actually, a lot of people would say, a totalitarian dictatorship. Uh, A lot of, you know, neighboring states there think that they're being threatened again by the Soviet Union. Uh, We're seeing a wave of nationalist populism that's sweeping that area and a good part of the world. A lot of it has to do with anti-immigration. Poland seems to have moved in that direction. Uh, let me ask you: Do you do you agree one with that assessment? And what do you see when you're over there as far as what's happening, you know, politically and geopolitically? Yeah, you know, and this kind of brings up what you said earlier about you know to remove biases. It's really good to go someplace. So you know, I, I've spent some time in Poland in the last few years. I'll, I'll be there again uh, next week. And what I see when I go there, um, well, the one thing you don't see is you won't see a lot of immigrants. You won't see people of color, you know, so, so that, that, that you won't see. Uh, but what you do see is, you know, it's a free country, uh, free election, free press. The press is actually owned about 70 percent of it is owned by liberal, um, you know, companies. Um, you do have the people who have, you know, the freedom to make decisions and choices and the other thing to keep in mind that Poland, throughout their history, they have been invaded and have, I mean, Poland was literally wiped off the map 
uh, for 150 years. I was actually the MC at a concert, so I'm learning a lot of this stuff myself in uh, November. November 11th was the 100-year anniversary of Poland's independence because for 150 years, uh, there was no Poland. You know, they had been invaded by right. Russia, by the Prussians, by Austria. So they're very sensitive. You can, you can understand why they would be sensitive, uh, you know, in terms of having people come into the country. Mm-hmm. Now, now, that being said, you know, I, I think, you know, and there's, a lot of, and there's a lot of discussion in the government. You know, there is something to be said for allowing immigrants to allow new ideas. And I do know they lo- allow a lot of people from the Ukraine in, but there needs to be, you know, discussion um, immigration is a good thing, but you know it needs to be done responsibly. And certainly in Poland, their situation is a little unique. You know, they're not like the United States, surrounded by oceans. Uh, they're surrounded by, you know, over the course of history, have been natural enemies. So you know, they they uh, I, I can understand why they would do a lot to protect their autonomy um, and make the decisions, but there's a lot of lively debate there. Um, you're right. The current government, you know, does tend to be more, uh, right, right, uh, more protectionist, but, but I also know that there is a lot of very healthy discussion that takes place. They love to talk politics and, uh, people are free to make, uh, you know, their own choices. And it, would you would you recommend it as as a place for for someone to visit? Let's say, okay, I'm not of Polish descent, but I love going to new places. I have not been to Poland yet. It, would would going to Warsaw or Krakow be a good trip vacation for somebody who likes to explore? I would put Poland very high on the list. I absolutely would. It's probably not you know something that you would think of, but and not necessarily Warsaw, but Krakow is a beautiful city. Mm-hmm. Uh, Gdansk on the Baltic Sea is a very historic city. Zakopane is in the mountains. You're literally in the mountains right on the border with the Slovakia. It, it, it's a beautiful country. And it's become to the point now, people in Poland live very good. You, I was there 20 years ago. It was a much different country. Today, uh, you know, you wouldn't feel much different from traveling just about anywhere in the United States. But you still have, you know, the the villages, the hamlets, uh, you know, you have the culture, you know, centuries old churches. Uh, the people are extremely friendly. Uh, most young people, you know, can't speak English. Um, so, yeah, I, I would definitely put Poland on the list of places to visit. I, I think it was something that the most travelers would quite enjoy. All right. Um, great perspective. Um, I was going to ask you about what your next project is, but I'm assuming it's going to be adding to the book since you've got so many new uh, episodes and stories to tell. Would that be right? Yeah, uh, that is true. Um, you know, I, I didn't know it was going to go here, but I'm really looking for my father's given me some stories that I can't wait to publish in the new account. I mean, there's some humorous, some really fun stories. Um, also, Anna Maria Anders told me she'd write a foreword for the book, and I'm just going to make uh, uh, you know, uh, the epilogue, you know, everything that's happened since. I tell you, John, to me, so many, a lot of people have mentioned to me this would make a great movie. So, I, 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 if it ever goes in that direction, that would be exciting for me. Um, you know, I, I, I could also see it, you know, uh, as you know, pretty good. Uh, it would be a very interesting film. But beyond that, I, I just love the whole travel. I love all the doors have opened. I, I love the writing. Uh, so, you know, wh- whether it be this book or tied to this book or something else, I, I'm going to keep the ball rolling here. Wonderful. Well, we um, just uh, put this uh, in the back of your head. We work with a virtual training system. It's a platform. It's called Lightspeed VT. It's out of Las Vegas. I think you doing a course on a, how to research your family background and write a book would be a great video course that people would love to take. So. Oh. Put that in the back of your head. We can talk about that uh, okay. off uh, off later. We can definitely yeah. do that. Andy, thank you so much for sharing all that with me. It is a fascinating story on so many levels. Uh, not only what you went through, uh, but chronicling what your what your dad and your uncle went through. So, again, I, I appreciate it. Thank you so much. Oh, it's my pleasure, John. We are talking with Andy Bida, the author of the book, Captured in Liberation. I urge you to get this book even before he puts all the other stuff in. You can get the other stuff later. Uh, It's available at his website, which is www.abajda.com. That's abida.com. And folks, thanks for joining us here on Undercover Jet Setter. Check out our other podcast on Spreaker. You can follow us on Facebook and Twitter, and you can see our show episodes and segments on YouTube at Undercover Jet Setter. Cheers, everyone. 
For more on Undercover Jet Setter, go to UndercoverJetsetter.com and check us out on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram.